Hey, welcome to CS420. I'm Brother Slade. I'm sure I've had most of you in my class before, um, but it'll be a great semester. All right, so hopefully you have uh, found the main page of our uh, class in Canvas. And on this main page, you'll find a link to all the lecture notes. Now, each day you'll uh, each day of class will have a lecture, and um, that'll be an assignment, uh, usually a quiz that you'll turn in. And in that lecture, you will have uh, the following. Um, you'll have a video. Now, there's no video here because this is lecture one, and I'm uh, recording the video right now. But as soon as the video is recorded, I'll put it right here. There'll be a link to some lecture notes. And then you'll just take a quiz and answer uh, the questions about that lecture. Now, this quiz will usually be due at midnight, the day of the lecture. So um, you can watch it whenever you want. Uh, just make sure you uh, watch it and answer the quiz questions before midnight of that day. There'll usually be three lectures a week, one for Monday, one for Wednesday, and one for Friday. Of course, when there's a holiday, there won't be a lecture that day. Now, these quizzes will be worth 10% of your uh, grade for this semester, so you won't want to miss a lot of them. But I will drop a, a couple lecture quizzes. Uh, Canvas will automatically do that. And that's just in case some emergency happened and you weren't able to complete the quiz on time. Now, there are homework assignments. And there'll be one homework assignment due each day of class, except for the first two days of class. We won't have homework until Monday, uh, May 4th. But the first homework assignment uh, will be homework three. And if you notice, there's a practice, and then there's the actual homework. So the practice is your chance to try to complete the homework as best you can. This is graded based solely on your effort. So if you complete the homework, you just turn in your completed homework assignment for the practice. If you couldn't complete your homework, now you need to include in comments some questions that you have as you try to complete the homework. And if you notice, that is due before class that day. So our class time is 12.30 on um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So before class, you have to submit a homework practice. And this is the practices are worth 30% of your final grade. And I, again, they're graded based on your effort. So if you couldn't complete it, you need to include some uh, questions on what was preventing you from completing the homework assignment. And then um, we will meet on uh, Microsoft Teams or Zooms, probably Microsoft Teams, uh, at class time. And that will be a chance that we have to go over the homework uh, questions that you have. And we might actually complete most of the homework assignments during that uh, time that we meet together. Now, it's not required to meet with the class and attend the live session. I will try to record it and then give you a video uh, link to uh, the recording where you can watch it later. But I do highly recommend that you try to make the live class sessions so that you can ask questions on your homework and make sure that you understand. Now, after, uh, after we had a chance to ask uh, questions on the homework, then well, you can ask questions on the lecture videos and the lectures. So um, really, class time, the virtual meeting that we'll have, will be dedicated to just answering questions. So um, all the lectures will be uh, videos that you watch, and you'll read the lecture notes as well. So all of that will be done on your own independently. Um, we're just meeting together so that we can um, collect all of the questions the full class has and address all of them together. So that way, if someone has a question you didn't think of, they, they can ask it during that time and you can hear the answer. And I think that'll help all of us. Now, later on at midnight on that same day that we had our homework practice due and then we met virtually, and then on uh, that time day, on midnight, you need to turn in a completed homework assignment. And this one is graded on correctness. Does the program that uh, you have to make work? Are your answers correct? So um, the practice, again, is based on effort. This is based on uh, having a completed assignment. 
that'll be worth just 10% of your grade. So if you notice, your practice is worth more than the homework assignment. So I care that you're really trying to um, get and understand the homework and you're showing that effort. And then uh, I will probably give you the answer in class. So um, anybody can just copy down the answer that they got to, um, in class and then submit it. So the homeworks will probably be pretty easy and that's why they're not worth as much. But I am going to really check to make sure you're putting up uh, a lot of effort before class to try to complete your practice assignments. So if you got it completed for the practice, then you would submit the same thing for your homework. You'd have to submit it twice. Once for the practice, once for the homework. Just because you got 100% and you got it completed for the practice, doesn't mean that you can skip turning it in for your homework. It's just I, I can't um, grade both of them at the same time. So you'll need to submit it uh, twice. Now one last thing, um, when you click on these practices, you um, this first one has uh, some information in it, but a lot of them will be blank. So the actual assignment won't be in the practice. What you'll have to do is click on the homework assignment itself to figure out what your homework assignment is and then you'll do that um, for your practice and for your homework. So the, I'm not, I guess I could copy and paste this into the practice but that would just be a kind of a lot of busy work. So just look on the homework assignment, try to do it as well as you can. If you uh, get it, turn it in for both the homework and the practice. If you don't get it, add your questions that you have um, show at least your program up to the point where you got it and submit that for the practice. Attend the virtual class, then figure out how to get it working by asking questions in the virtual class, and then submit your completed homework assignment. Now you can view the official syllabus right here that has the breakdown of all of your grades. It also has uh, policies about your uh, late homework, late work, um, basically, I, I won't accept late work, but I do drop a, a couple of homework assignments uh, and practices and also the uh, engagement for watching the lectures. So um, you can read uh, through that right here. And then, of course, a link to all the lecture notes, but we'll have the link in the engagement assignment as well. Now, uh, things that you don't have to worry about right away. First, there'll be a final project where you will choose a programming language and you'll do a little bit, uh, re a little report on it. And you'll also do a presentation. So you'll make a screencast or a video of you presenting about your uh, language. And we'll share that with the full class so the class can uh, look at the people's languages and learn about new languages. Also, there will be a, a, and that's worth 10% of your grade, there will be a midterm and a final exam, and they will be given on Canvas using Proctorial, and they'll be worth 40% of your grade. Now, we'll be learning a new language called Racket, and uh, Racket is, called, is a functional programming language, and it's unlike other languages that you have learned up to this point. Now, I don't think that you'll use Racket a lot after you graduate, but forcing you to program uh, in a purely functional way will help you gain the skills to use the functional features that are in other programming languages, like JavaScript, uh, Swift, and Ruby, and a lot of other languages have these functional features in them. And if you aren't forced to learn them, then you'll never really learn the entire power of all of those languages. So we're going to strip away all of the iterative features that you have learned in programming. And you, we're going to focus on some functional features. And that will really help you learn how to use the other programming languages a lot better. So you can download Racket by clicking on this link right here and just download it and install it. It should install on a Windows, Mac, and even Linux if you want to do that. Now downloading uh, Racket will come with a few programs, so the only program we'll need to use is called Dr. Racket. So make sure you start up Dr. Racket, not just Racket, and you'll get a user uh, uh, interface or a IDE like this. And this is a lot like a JES where you can type your functions up here and you can test them out down here in this area here. Now yours might have different colors. Um, this is following the default theme 
of my computer um, in dark mode and I believe that if you don't use dark mode then you'll have a white uh, GUI here but either way it should work. Now before Racket, um, Racket uh, evolved from a language called Scheme so when you read all of the lecture notes you'll notice that it says Scheme a lot and I should probably just go through and update those and say Racket um, but uh, all of the stuff uh, that you can do in Scheme in those lecture notes we can do in Racket. So we are using Racket. Now we need to uh, use choose our Racket, our specific language, and this EOPL stands for Essentials of Programming Language. Yeah, so we'll have to put this on the top of all of our files to let us know that we want to use the Essentials of Programming Languages. And that's a textbook where we got most of the material from the class, but you don't have to buy that textbook. You just need the videos and the online lectures. Now, uh, you might be able to get away with uh, using the Racket language, just the default uh, base Racket language. It'll do some different things until we get to a certain point when we need some of the packages that come with the EOPL. So I would just, uh, by habit, always use EO EOPL before your thing. That way if there's anything that doesn't work right at least we're dealing with the same language uh, and not have to know that it's your configuration that's being different. So now let's talk about some of the material in Lecture 1. Of course covering the syllabus is in there but um, let's move on to this and now that we've covered that let's move on to this right here and interpreters as an architectural concept. I just want to say something really quick about this. Um, a lot of languages are general purpose. They do a lot of things, uh, different things like Java, Ruby, uh, a lot of the languages that you've learned. But sometimes we need a domain specific language or that's called a DSL. So whenever you hear somebody say a DSL, that's a domain specific language. So domain-specific languages are built to solve a very specific purpose. And um, maybe you might think of um, CSS as a domain-specific language because it deals with styling up HTML. There are other uh, examples of DSLs. Just do a Google search and you'll find them. But some ways, uh, when, we, uh, when you want to solve a problem, it might make sense to make our own programming language that's specific for that problem. Um, so this is a, a really good uh, idea as a concept of making an interpreter. And that's what we're going to do in this class. We're going to make an interpreter. So we're going to learn Racket for the first half of the class. And then after we learn Racket, we're going to build an interpreter. And we're going to invent our own language. Well, OK, it's already been invented by the textbook. We're just going to uh, use that invention. We're going to build our own interpreter. Now, um, the last thing that we'll talk about is uh, these uh, three specific things. Three things that every programming language has. Primitive expressions, a means of combination, and a means of abstraction. Now, primitives are the built-in things that we have in languages, like numbers. We have numbers. We have characters, we have strings. So th those are the things that are built into a language. Now we also have uh, operations like uh, plus uh, right there. That's a built-in operation. Those are all of our primitives. So there, there are basic building blocks. Now that we have basic building blocks, we have to have a way to combine them together and this is adding 5 plus 6 right here. So that's our means of combination. And then we also have an, a way to abstract information, like defining something. So I could say uh, g is the result of adding 5 and 6 together. So uh, usually a means of uh, abstraction includes uh, some name. And I'm getting uh, my languages mixed up. Uh, that's uh, Python. Um, in in Racket, we have to type out define all the way, and now we can see that G is 11. So um, there we go. We have our primitives, which are their, our base types, and every language needs to have those. And then once we have all those built-in things, we have to have a way where we can combine them together like this. 
And then finally, in a way to abstract away details. And that's usually by naming stuff. We, we give operations a name, we give end results a name, variables a name, we give functions a name. And that's a way we abstract away a bunch of complicated stuff and we can hide it away underneath a function name. Like taking the square root of a function. If I gave you an assignment right now to write a function that does the square root and it doesn't use the built-in square root function, and that might be a hard assignment for you to do. But um, because uh, somebody has already done it and they named it square root, you can now use that and not really know how it works. You know that it just takes the square root of a number. And that is abstraction.